Diving, for me, is peace. It's a transition from a, a weighted world of bustle into this fantastic, peaceful, translucent world. The reason why I like diving as an archaeologist is that when I get down there, I feel, I see, I touch things. And so if I can engage with my wreck directly through diving, that's, that's the best. Lying in nearly 100 meters of water, a 10th century Byzantine shipwreck. From a thousand year empire that at its height ruled much of Europe and the Middle East. It's the oldest connection to our seafaring past, made by one of the largest deep water expeditions ever undertaken. In 2015, the maritime archaeologist John Adams began a three-year mission to discover how the Black Sea was formed. 20,000 years ago, this vast sea was a prehistoric lake unconnected to the world's oceans. Large swathes of it was dry land on which early humans walked. How it then flooded remains disputed. Adams has brought together a team of leading international scientists to try and solve the puzzle. This is really going to sound cheesy, but we really are making history. And with some of the most sophisticated deep water equipment yet developed, the team also planned to search these unique waters for traces of the lost civilizations who lived and sailed on the Black Sea. They've journeyed to more than two kilometers below the surface and made discoveries that will redefine maritime archaeology. Perfectly preserved shipwrecks from history's greatest empires. Now, the lost Byzantine merchant ship is the subject of a perilous dive by John Adams to retrieve an ancient amphora from among its timbers. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. With every meter a diver descends, air becomes increasingly toxic. John Adams is diving to 95 meters. He's breathing a delicate mix of oxygen, helium, and nitrogen to avoid potentially deadly effects of toxicity and the bends. Adams and his dive partner 
Rasmus Ravensburg, are the first to board the Byzantine for more than a thousand years. Don't expect to see as much as you do so soon. It's almost like an artist's reconstruction, but actually for real. So I could see the whole array of frames and the section of planks. And there's a really nice uh, set of timbers that go all the way across the ship. And in fact, you can see them actually. We're just approaching them here. And essentially, there's these pristine vertical boards. This is a bulkhead. And it looks as though it was made yesterday. It's absolutely smooth. There's no tool marks on this wood either. So they must have finished it off by scraping. OK, then you can start recovering them. Right. Adams has just 23 minutes to find the amphora and maneuver it onto the ROV. If he stays any longer, his return to the surface will become ever more perilous. Now it's nine minutes, John and the guys. The ROV has followed the diver's progress to the wreck. It'll help with the amphora's retrieval. Amphorae are made to be carried by the handles with 20 gallons of liquid inside, which is, which is a lot of weight. And in fact, this was full of sediment and it was heavier than I thought it would be. This way, yeah. Recovered from the seabed after a thousand years, the amphora, once a disposable container, is now a historical treasure. Okay, swinging. It came to the surface, came without stress to the amphora. The operation is complete. Now we can breathe. Up from the, from the 
you're in this huge, great space of water, this wonderful sort of limpid void. And there down on the seafloor is this sort of panorama of, of ancient shipwreck and lights to movement and technology. And I just had this sort of panorama in front of me, and I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not going down. I mean, it's, that's one of the most spectacular moments I've ever had, I think, in my whole diving career, looking at that site, hovering at about 75 metres, looking down at 95 metres, looking down at that site, going absolutely amazing. At the United Kingdom's National Oceanography Centre, scientists from the expedition have spent six months trying to settle the argument over how the Black Sea flooded. Last year, they selected 73 sites to call. Six-metre hollow tubes were pushed into the seabed. Once extracted, they contain layers of sediment dating back tens of thousands of years. The scientists hope these sediments will reveal evidence of the ancient prehistoric lake that existed before the Black Sea flooded. That is time travel, isn't it? That is that moment captured just like that. Early research of one particular core revealed prehistoric shells that would normally be found on a lake shore. The core containing the shells was taken nearly 50 kilometers from the coast. It's evidence of where the prehistoric lake once was and how much of the coastal shelf could have been used by early humans. The scientists then turned to a different core to understand how the prehistoric lake then flooded and became the Black Sea. It contains layers of sediment stretching back tens of thousands of years. The small changes in texture are the result of fresh water pouring into the lake. So the sediments accumulate very slowly, but what they do is they trap a, a, trap a story in them. And what you see by the texture of this material is there are changes in here. The process that's causing this is actually a lot of fresh water coming in through the rivers, um, which will probably be causing flooding events. As the Ice Age ended and the earth warmed, the vast rivers, today's Danube, Dniester and Don, raised the level of the lake. So this is our grey lake muds through to the top here, where we have a full connection with the Mediterranean Sea. So very slowly, over a couple of metres we go from fresh to full marine. Found in several cores, these long, continuous layers of grey mud laid down over thousands of years are proof that the lake filled slowly with river water before the rising Mediterranean poured in through the Bosphorus. the sudden catastrophic flood. It's a fantastic idea, and it's a, it was a story that grabbed people's imagination. Um, but our data does not s support that theory. We would say quite definitely that the process happened much more gradually that has been proposed in the past. It wasn't weeks or months. It was a gradual process over a period of a few thousand years. And what that process led to was the Black Sea's eventual connection with the Mediterranean and ancient empires that surrounded it, opening up new trade routes for their seafarers to explore. But so far, the team have not found any shipwrecks from those ancient civilizations. 
43 wrecks were discovered last year, and the oldest was from the 10th century. The medieval ship may have been John Adams' favorite find from last year, but he knows that seafarers from both the Greek and Roman empires journeyed to the Black Sea and settled on its shores. He knows the sea's uniquely anoxic waters, which preserve organic material, offer his expedition a chance to travel back deep into the distant past. Given the size and depth of the Black Sea, and the intensity of maritime enterprise that's happened in it and on it over the last several thousand years, there will be an enormous amount of historical and archaeological material in the water. So we've only started to nibble away at what must be down there. It's the expedition's final voyage to the Black Sea. The team has just one month to find evidence from the lost empires whose ships once sailed these mysterious waters. What we all really would like is to find a pre-Christian Greek ship. That would be, would be really be the thing. Uh, they should be out here somewhere. Working with Adams, are the Bulgarian archaeologists Kalin Dimitrov and Veso Dragunov, scientists who've spent years in the Black Sea looking for evidence of early civilizations. The team is on a different ship, the Havila. She's bigger and even better equipped than last year's survey vessel. Without bragging, I would say that this is the most well-equipped survey vessel uh, there is in the world. So uh, let's use the equipment we have on board. Let's find that those fantastic ships that is really going to be changing stuff. Many of the ROV crew from last year have volunteered again. All stations on the off deck. The remotely operated vehicle they'll be sending to the seabed is at the cutting edge of subsea technology. And is a natural wreck hunter. Controlled through a fiber optic cable, the Surveyor Interceptor can travel four times faster than other ROVs. Combined with a powerful sonar, it allows them to scan much more of the sea floor looking for shipwrecks. Okay. It'll be Adams's primary weapon of detection. And more than ever, he'll be in the hands of the ROV pilots and the survey team. Scientists surveying. Yes, sir, Rodrigo. Yep, we've got a wreck coming through on the port side of the side scan. If you can see there, I'll send through the coordinates in a second. Roger that. Having detected a signature, the surveyor is retrieved, and the Schilling ROV, with its array of cameras and manipulator arms, will inspect what's down there.
It will take the ROV 40 minutes to travel the two kilometers to the seabed. As it descends below 150 meters, so the water becomes anoxic. In this dead zone, oxygen disappears and organic materials like ancient wooden timbers survive. The first wreck is a 200-year-old ship from the time of the Ottomans, who controlled the Black Sea from the 15th to the 19th century. It's the same as many of the wrecks they found last year. I don't think we're going to understand anything off this wreck. But as the shilling returns to the surface, the crew see alarming evidence of an unexpected danger in the Black Sea's abyss. See those uh, detailed uh, that has all these black stains? Yes. They were spotless, stainless steel. What's happened to them? No, it's the, the hostile environment, basically. The black stains are caused by poisonous hydrogen sulfide attacking the metal. It's eating into the ROV. This toxic chemical might be the reason why they have yet to find any ancient wrecks. It smells like rotten eggs. You know, the typical smell of sulfur. And so it smells really bad. So we need to wash all our stuff properly. We have the ROVs then go down on 2,000 meters. They need to be washed thoroughly because otherwise you're going to have all the fittings and everything is going to corrode. Hydrogen sulfide is produced by microscopic bacteria. These bacteria live in filaments that cling to the timbers of the wreck. Some of the scientists now suspect that as well as producing hydrogen sulfide, these bacteria are feeding on the wreck's timbers. We looked at about 41 sites last year. The oldest one was 10th century, Byzantium. Is this because the older ones simply aren't surviving? There's something in the chemistry of the environment which keeps them well preserved for a thousand years or more, but then after that they dissolve. And I can't really think that's right. If that's not, if that, yeah, the bottom, bottom corner down there. That's yeah. this there, yeah, that's it, yes. To find out if the bacteria are slowly destroying the wrecks, a sample of wood is retrieved for analysis. Methodical, accurate. So from this piece of wood, I will produce this very, very thin section with a stain that I add. Then I can take under the microscope and I can see what's going on. The blue dye that's added to the wood sample will reveal the level and rate of degradation that the expedition is up against. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. Oh, We're hello. Here. You're here. <laughs> hello, Lotte. <Lothar>. Yeah, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Welcome. Push, push. Yeah, I'm just looking at a small section I just cut. Where you can see the blue one, very degraded cells next to the white ones, which are fresh. But sooner or later, this white one will also turn blue. This is why this, when we take the samples underwater, we, there's absolutely no mechanical strength yeah, left in the Yeah, there's no mechanical yeah. strength at all. Yeah. These bacteria that degrades the wood here are very specialized bacteria. They will oh. um, go into the wood, find the anatomical openings within the fibers, and from there they will scratch a little hole and they will find all their food. Oh. Okay. So the wood 
It looks yeah, yeah. intact in the water, but yeah. it's not. Yeah. It, the, the cell wall is like a skeleton of the wood. That's uh, the only part that the bacteria cannot degrade, so that's why it's still, when it's wet, it still keeps out its form. So, here we go. You can even see it if you use this needle yeah. here. It's a little sharp. Yeah, and you can, it goes in easily. Yeah. You can just press it by your hands yeah. without yeah, yeah. no... Yeah. And now I, I suppose that we can... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it will look out here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so soft yeah. and spongy, there's not much left, really. Mm. Well, the archaeologists describe it as well preserved. And I describe the works as heavily degraded, like a honeycomb. They are empty and very, very fragile. Lying on the sea floor, the Black Sea's ancient shipwrecks may be little more than fragile husks from the past, but they should still be out there. John Adams just hasn't found them. How the hell did that get out here? With seven days left of the multi-million dollar expedition, time is running out. We're done, yeah. Alex, it suddenly hit me. The 2016 season had been so successful. How on earth could we possibly hope to equal it, let alone exceed it? So that's the moment you wake up at four in the morning saying, you know, we've got a ship carrying 70 people, millions of pounds of equipment, and you've got 25 days to do a series of interrelated and complex tasks. Is there any way I can control this? And there isn't really. But the Bulgarian archaeologists, Kalin and Veso, think they can help. Kalin and Veso uh, had more information yeah, about they stuff. Also, they've got another possible wreck somewhere. Right they now. have these but, two but, points but. where they say every time someone goes out on a fishing boat, they yeah, come yeah, back yeah. with something. Yeah. Kalin has been tipped off by local fishermen who say they found evidence of a wreck nearby. Fishermen have been working their nets in these waters for thousands of years, exploiting the annual Black Sea migrations of Bonito, Scad and Anchovy. Now, they've told Colleen that their nets have been picking up pieces of ceramics from the sea floor. At least at uh, two, two times, uh, fishermen catch uh, amphoras uh, with their nets. Amphora were used by the Romans and the ancient Greeks to transport olive oil, wine and fish paste throughout the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. for sure that this amphora came from uh, shipwrecks that are exposed on the uh, bottom. We have a uh, theoretical orientation of the area, so we'll try to find this shipwreck. Scanning the shallow coastal waters where the fishermen had worked their nets, the Havilla picks up a new signature. The Bulgarian fishermen were right. A single amphora lies on the seabed. <laughs> There's little of the wreck left, but it's evidence that older finds are out there.
The Havilla continues on a heading that keeps them in shallow water, closer to the coast. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but uh, can you make a fix uh, for me? Yes, There was an anomaly on the port side. So you have something out there. The expedition's luck has finally turned. What's this? What's this? Ah, yes. Here we go. That's what it is. That's, an opera. That's yes. what it is. Yes, it is. Amphorae, dozens of them, from a Roman cargo ship still intact after 2,000 years. Okay. What we have is a complete cargo of Amphora sitting down there, still on the decks of the ship that carried it. So, not bad, eh? Each of these clay vessels is a time capsule waiting to be recovered, containing clues about the world from which they and the ship came. They have the neck height. I think it's exactly this type. If we recovered an amphora, we could have a very quick general idea about the location um, of the production center of the amphorae and probably even their contents and the origin of the ship's journey. At a depth of 95 meters, it's possible to dive and retrieve an amphora. But getting divers back into the water takes days of preparation and the expedition's clock is ticking. Using the ROV and its manipulator arm would be quicker. But picking up a 2,000-year-old clay artifact hydraulically is fraught with risk. Without knowing its precise size and weight, there's a danger the ROV will break it. The scientists have an ace up their sleeve. The surveyor interceptor has a laser scanner, which can record a perfect blueprint of the wreck and the dimensions of the amphora they want to recover. Flying low, the surveyor's laser scans the wreck, millimeter by millimeter. The amphora is 80 centimeters tall and 50 centimeters wide, big enough to carry 20 liters of olive oil or wine 
small enough for a grown man to heave onto a Roman cargo ship. The plan that's been hatched to retrieve the amphora is Scandinavian in its simplicity. If we could modify, say, one of these suction cups for the toilets, they must have something like that on board. And then get it, suck it, and lift it. <laughs> yeah. The ROV pilots get to work. The key components, one plastic hose and a toilet plunger. See, see. Forward a little bit. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, come down a little bit. Come over to my arm. Rip my skull over there. No, 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 don't stress, down, down, down. Easy peasy. Crane, coming down. Lost for nearly 2,000 years, the amphora is back on the surface. A new ship now, and a different crew. Every single person on this ship now can relate in a certain way to every single artifact that we are retrieving. Because it is a piece of our common global heritage and the lifetime of our forefathers. In fact, every artifact you discover brings you one step closer to the humans who actually built it and actually used it and carried it. 
it had a meaning for someone. Amphora were the everyday vessels for storing food in ancient times. And the sea was the cheapest and fastest means of transporting them across the Roman Empire. At its height, Rome controlled over half of the Black Sea. Their ships would journey from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea's northern shores to trade wine and olive oil for timber and grain. To avoid the treacherous coastline, the Roman traders would have sailed further out in blue water. I think we see evidence for blue water sailing surprisingly early. And I don't think you could generalize that at certain periods, seafarers would have hugged the shore and gone, you know, coast hopping and stuff like that. Um, in most areas of the world, early evidence suggests they didn't do that. With less than a week left at sea, the Havilla has changed course. She's now lying in deeper water, on an ancient shipping route that Adams hopes early navigators would have used, and where the Black Sea's anoxic water should have better preserved the wrecks. Within hours of leaving the coastal shelf, the team pick up a new wreck signature. Lying more than two kilometers below the surface, it's one of the deepest wrecks the team has found. Yeah, the depth here is 2,067 meters. That was probably... Uh... Historically, archaeologically, that may be our most important moment. The wreck is on its side, half buried in the seabed. That was a case of seeing things on the wreck that rang bells. You couldn't instantly identify it, but you think, I've seen this before somewhere, or where have I seen that? Can we just go over the top and looking down? Incredible. Oh, but it's not period of incredible, is it? Its quarter rudder with a tiller still attached was actually sloping into the seabed and it looked really well preserved. So we decided to expose the whole of the rudder blade to get its shape because quite often they're a little bit diagnostic. The design of the rudder could give Adams an indication of when the ship sailed. According to ancient iconography, a straight rudder could mean the wreck is Roman. So we were sort of expecting uh, a Roman-style rudder. I still can't really believe what we found. Oh, yes, perfect. That's lovely. Keep going, Tormund. Get on. Keep that demon vacuuming going. For two hours, the ROV pilots use a vacuum pump to suck away thick layers of sediment that have built up around the rudder over thousands of years.
They've got to the end of the blade, but it doesn't seem to look like a straight Roman rudder. Fantastic. This one? Older. A lot older than that. Six feet of sediment has been sucked away to reveal a curved, shaped rudder. It's not Roman. It's much older, from ancient Greece, two and a half thousand years ago. There's a ship design on a pot which is called the Siren Vase, which is actually currently in the British Museum. It has rudders that are identical in shape to the one that we exposed that day on the seabed. see the exact same shape of the blade of the counter rather resemble very strongly the one that we just studied and just discovered. Even the position of the mast in the fore quarter of the ship um, is very, very similar. So there's very strong evidence to suggest at this stage of research a date, probably somewhere in the 5th century BC, somewhere in the classical Greek age. So quite incredible, quite incredible. Yeah. This, this will be the earliest ship that we discovered. Have you seen something like that before? Never. No. I'm not sure anybody has. <laughs> so many aspects of the maritime past are always slightly vague, undocumented, and quite often it's the shipwrecks that provides us with ways of viewing aspects of history that aren't written down. So we're now beginning to get a far deeper understanding of what went on and why. In the historic Bulgarian port of Sozopol, land-based archaeological digs have uncovered evidence of the ancient Greek colonies that settled on these shores. A hoard of artifacts reveals how, 3,000 years ago, trading empires from the Mediterranean began to look east to the Black Sea. It's a tangible link for maritime archaeologists Drago Garbov and Helen Farr to the ancient Greeks who came and lived in Sozopol, far from their homeland. So yeah, the ancient Greeks arrived here in the 7th century BC. So they're coming across through the Bosphorus into the Black Sea, settling here, and then instantly trading. Exactly. I think what came in mostly was exotic mm. foods and also luxury goods. These vessels, the perfume bottles, yeah. and they contain such strong essences inside that mm. at the moment of discovery, they usually still bear the aroma of what was inside them. Wow. Mm. It just really appeals to me that you could smell something from that long ago. What's that? Oh, that's a fish grill. <laughs> um, we find them in interesting contexts. In fact, most of them have been discovered um, on top of graves. So once a burial ah. would occur, uh, the relatives or friends of the deceased would come back to regularly. Have a party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to perform really? yeah, yeah, rituals <laughs> and feasts. And you can see the burning on it as well. Exactly, yeah, it yeah. has been used. And that, that really brings in to the picture, the fact that these people were living here, not just the traders that are coming across from Greece, but it's families, it's the old, there's the young, there's the babies and children. Yeah, that's a, those are lovely things, lovely artifacts. They just drive that home really clearly. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> The expedition has been at sea for 24 days, and it's taking its toll. Mile upon mile surveyed, day and night, in the hunt for new wrecks. We have to do more captives. <coughs> yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. We've been doing a really, really good project, but it has been taking the toll, and especially from the from the RV crew. 1,400 kilometer of seafloor mapped, and they're they're exhausted now, really. I was tired at the end, but I wasn't weary in the sense of we've, we've done it, we've done enough, I want to go home. <laughs> if we'd had another, another 10 days at sea to do more of the same, I would have grabbed it. There are only two days to go, and John Adams won't let up. The Black Sea is a huge repository of historically important wrecks. We've now looked at probably about 60 in the last three years, and, and we even need to scratch the surface. The Black Sea preserves wrecks in remarkable condition, but they've yet to make a find that offers a perfect window to the past. Scientists survey. We've got a wreck coming through on the fire scan at 42 degrees 0453 north. Thank you. There is time, just, for one more discovery. Oh, they got As we came towards it, it was one of those, you know, images resolving out of the murk. And then you're looking at an intact hull. Your immediate reaction is, oh, well, it's intact, it must be modern. And then as we came towards the stern of the wreck, we recognised a quarter rudder. And then it started to dawn on us. The quarter rudders, the style of the planking, the position of the mast, the, the whole shape of the hull. I'm looking at a ship that's 2,000 years old, and it's still complete. And it's got rope still tied to its mast and hanging off the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You run out of words. The wreck is Roman, dating from the first century AD. No one has ever seen an ancient shipwreck like this. Still so intact and so well preserved. That's astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. The feeling of looking at something like that, just standing there in front of you, that moment of revelation, that moment of truth, that moment of discovery.
that's a feeling you can't really, um, you know, describe. And big beam in the bow, near the bow. Traditionally, archaeologists have relied on classical iconography to try to understand Roman seafaring. Not anymore. We're 21 meters <laughs> and still going. When you see the size of this shipwreck, all of a sudden your mind just goes, I, I had no idea it was that big. This was not just a fisherman going up and down the coast, this was a serious business. And this is the kind of things that we're interested in archaeology, is, is giving that richness, that texture to human lives, human past lives. What we have is a complete ship sitting down there. It's a spectacular find. And when we tie it down, I mean, it's probably one of the most important shipwreck finds ever. Layer by layer, the three-year expedition has unearthed the ancient past of the Black Sea, revealing histories of people who faced a changing climate and sailed the high seas in search of empire and fortune. Yep, we've got a wreck coming through on the port side of the side scanner. More than 60 wrecks discovered, a medieval ship that Marco Polo might have sailed on. Stunning, my mind has gone. A huge Roman cargo vessel that was trading 2,000 years ago. <laughs> An ancient Greek ship that plied these waters when Plato was alive. Have you seen something like that before? I'm not sure anybody has. <laughs> Further back in time, the debate over how and when the Black Sea flooded has been settled. Not a catastrophic or biblical flood, but a slow inundation as the prehistoric lake was filled, first by the great rivers that drain into it, and finally as the rising Mediterranean poured in. Years ago, archaeologists, even if they were working on a coastal site, they wouldn't look out to sea, they'd turn resolutely inland looking for the answers from the material that they could get at there. We now know that the sea is so important that you really need to turn around and look out to sea. The answers actually, in many cases, are out there. The depths of this unparalleled sea have revealed touchstones of our ancient past. Reminders of who we are and how we once lived thousands of years ago.